Now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer for the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary and those members of the body which we deem less honorable on these we bestow more abundant honor. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 20 to 23. Al-Masih kam! Christos Anasti! Christos Vosklesie! Christos Angat! Christ is risen! Your Eminence, Reverend Fathers, Brothers and Sisters in Christ. Mission is not abstract, but concrete. Not speculative, but historical. Not the theory of spreading the Gospel, but the fact. Mission is not Britain's mission or Antioch's mission. It is the mission of the Orthodox Church, the body of Christ. The Sea of Antioch is no island, but interlocked <coughs> with her sister seas of Constantinople, Alexandria, and Jerusalem, and as far afield as Moscow and Bucharest, Belgrade, or Sofia, indeed Australia and the Americas. My next door neighbor, who is a Buddhist or a Baptist, is not my flesh and blood. The faceless laborer in the cane fields of Uganda, who receives the body and blood of Christ in the Orthodox Church, is. Even so, the salmon fisherman off the shores of Alaska. Antioch dare not say to Constantinople or Moscow, I have no need of you. Prestigious Constantinople or populous Moscow dare not say to Antioch, we have no need of you. Our mission territory is not wherever Moscow or Constantinople or Alexandria have left off, let alone the Western heterodox. It is everywhere a single human being does not yet confess the true faith of the Orthodox Church and receive the precious body and blood of Christ. If we would be faithful to the mission of the Orthodox Church per se, not only of Antioch, we should ask, where have Orthodox missionaries so integrated a culture into the life of the Church that neither poverty nor persecution has ever been able to deprive that culture of its Orthodox identity? One shining example of successful mission belongs to the North American continent. What has the Alaska mission of 1794 to do with mission in Britain or Ireland in 2019? What then has the mission of a rabbi named Saul of Tarsus in AD 46 or 61 to do with us? Must you travel to Philippi, Corinth or Thessaloniki, Rome or Athens in order to read the epistles of St. Paul? To postmodern secular Britain the Apostle to the Gentiles is just as remote. The principles of mission and what it requires remain unchanged. On a remote peninsula in the northern Pacific above the 60th parallel near the Arctic Circle there lies a fervent unswaveringly faithful Orthodox diocese of 89 parishes. <coughs> The peninsula is the most sparsely populated area on its continent. In the winter, the air drops to minus 51 C and feels colder in the blistering wind and blinding snow. Over 11% of its people live below the national poverty level, eking out a living from oil, natural gas, timber and fisheries. To the natives of its enormous interior, the peninsula is called Alasikak. To its islanders, it is Alachskach. The earliest European explorers from across the Bering Sea called it Alaska, hence Alaska. The size of its interior, its two archipelagos to the southwest and the southeast, and especially its proximity to the Arctic Ocean, play pivotal roles in how and 
why the Orthodox mission took root. The Alaska mission offers a goalpost for all Orthodox mission in our times. An Orthodox Alaskan in our day, whatever his origin, thinks of the Orthodox faith no more as a Russian import than a Russian considers his a Greek or a Greek his a Syro-Palestinian. Orthodox Alaska does not depend on importing clergy or worship in an immigrant language. Alaska is no one's diaspora. It is its own unique Orthodox culture. It is a model of successful integration. Drawing certain principles for mission from this history of Orthodox Alaska, an irony emerges. Perhaps it is not ironic at all. It was not the missionaries who ultimately made the Orthodox faith inseparable from the identity of the Aleut, the Tlingit, and the Tanana peoples. It is the tears of the confessors and the blood of the martyrs. <coughs> it is what an Orthodox Alaskan was willing to suffer for his faith. Part 1, Native Alaska. Mission is challenge. Without challenge, there is no mission. In an era long before trains, cars, or planes, the sheer size of Alaska is a great challenge in itself. Covering 663,268 square miles, over a million kilometers, Alaska is almost a quarter the size of Canada, the size of, Eastern, of Western Europe, and twice the size of Texas. It is more than seven times the size of the United Kingdom. <coughs> Most of the UK fits neatly into its southeastern panhandle. Many outsiders picture Alaska thus. A barren Arctic wilderness of snow-covered mountains and glaciers. In such places as Dead Horse and Fort Yukon, more than a few inches of snow tend to fall in the winter. <laughs> the large panhandle in the southeast consists of lush green forests of spruce and pine, woodland floors lined with ferns. Nature in Alaska reminds mere homo sapiens that he is not master here. <laughs> Should he flee from the 11 to 15 foot polar bear of the north, he should come up face to face with the 1,000 pound Kodiak bear of the south. I doubt that this fence will deter him. Humility, the prerequisite of conversion and spiritual growth, is not abstract in Alaska. It is common sense. A variety of native cultures inhabits Alaska. They range from the Inupiaq of the north, insultingly called Eskimos, eaters of raw flesh, to the Yupik of the Pacific coast, the Tanana of the interior, the Tlingit of the southern panhandle, and the Aleut and Alutik of the western islands. Early missionaries had to learn languages closely related to Greenlandic on the one hand, and, as the inset map shows, Navajo and Apache on the other. The ability to learn language and customs is a prerequisite for mission. A missionary cannot afford to be provincial, but must be universal. Part 2. The Vallon Mission of 1794. The mission to Alaska begins in 1794, an age of empires. Most of Europe and the Middle East belong to multi-ethnic empires. Britain recently has lost its colonies on the Atlantic seaboard. France has lost its monarch. Like most of Orthodox Europe, Antioch falls under the Muslim regime of the Ottoman Empire. This means the only Orthodox power in a position to send missionaries is the vast Russian Empire. A man from 1799, a map from 1799 shows the 8,600,000 square miles of a Russian empire that spans two continents. 
Passing the Urals, one enters a desolate middle region called <laughs> Siberia before attaining the icy tundras of the Far East. Under the enlightened monarch, enlightened monarch, Catherine II, lucrative fur trade opens up in the easternmost colony of the Russian Empire across the Bering Sea. Despite Her Imperial Majesty's notorious distrust of monks, ultimately it is she who authorizes the mission. In the northwestern province called Karelia, bordering on Finland, lies a large men's monastery near a town called Valam. The Holy Fathers hear of an economic scheme, civilize the natives in order to persuade them to give more furs to the traders from Siberia. Just as our Lord calls fishermen to be fishers of men, the fathers from Valam hear the calling to trade not only in furs, but human souls for Christ. Is it significant that they are monks? Monks are available. They have no families or private possessions to tie them down. They live on the sparsest diet. In Valam, they are very used to short hours of daylight and heavy snows. Most of all, the monk is a living icon of one Christian virtue indispensable to the missionary, the spirit of self-sacrifice. The monk is the antonym of the consumer. Traveling to Alaska, he has no cozy little Russia in mind, no immigrant home away from home. He sacrifices all for God. Starting off in 1793, one Archimandrite Yoasaf, three Yero monks, one Yero Deacon, one lay monk, and two novices from Valam resolved to cross the 7,300 miles from Imperial St. Petersburg to the Aleutian Archipelago. It is nine months and three days on foot, then by ship before the eight missionaries land on Kodiak Island on 24 September 1794. Kodiak is the farthest eastern island in the archipelago. No, not yet. Okay. South of the mainland. Bypassing the smaller islands, they seek the main one. The first natives that they encounter are a fishing culture called Aleut. They subsist mostly on fish, seals, dolphins, and whales, using harpoons for hunting. The Aleutian otter bears a dense waterproof coat that fetches a high price in the markets of Europe. A bold breed of invaders, the Prabishleniki, use dog sleds and kayaks to traverse the islands in search of beaver and other pelts. They establish a prosperous fur trade in what later comes to be known as Russian America. No governor of Ruskaya America is as ruthless, ambitious, and tyrannical as Alexander Baranov. Trading with neighboring British Canada as well as New Spain, Baranov works native Aleuts like slaves and sends enough uh, bullion back to mainland Russia to cover his tracks. Archimandrite Yoasov complains in vain to St. Petersburg. Returning to Russia with Father Bakari and Yero Deacon Stepan, the ship sinks in the Bering Sea. Irritated by this monastic arrogance, Baranov places the remaining five missionaries under house arrest. A true missionary defends the rights of those entrusted to his care. Aware that the missionaries are advocating for them, the Aleuts flock to the remaining Yero monk, Father Juvenali. <coughs> Defying the arrest order, his arrest orders, he baptizes thousands. In the summer of 1796, he sails with an Aleut man to the west coast the land of the Yupiks. More warlike than the Aleuts, they have never seen the sign of the cross. 
mistaking it for witchcraft, they kill Father Juvenali and his companion with arrows and spears. The Alaska mission thus acquires its first yarrow barter. A precedent is now set. Would you risk indifference, ridicule, even death for the gospel? The two novices do not wait to find out. They return to the Russian mainland on the next ship. Only one of the original eight is left. He is a simple lay monk who all his life refuses even to be tonsured a reader. No soul has become so closely associated with the Alaska mission as Father Gerban or Herman of Alaska. A pen and ink sketch from his lifetime shows Father Herman outside his tiny skeet on Spruce Island, three miles north of Kodiak. He names it Nuvala, nursing the sick, adopting orphans. Above all, he teaches the faith. Children flock to him. Like most First Nations peoples of the Americas, his ability to tell stories indicates his holiness. The Aleuts call him Apu, that is, Abba, Father. He does not pander to the nostalgia of the aged, but invests in youth. Indeed, visiting nuns are known to visit him. By doing so, not only simply infants, but young adults, indeed visiting nuns, as I said, come to flock to him. When Governor Baranov orders him to stop stirring up the young natives, Father Herman ignores him. Mission dares to invest <coughs> in the future, not the past. The governor is the past. The monk and his beloved Aleuts are the future. <coughs> Aleut. In Father Herman's lifetime, Russian fur, fur trade influence extends as far south as the Columbia River in what is now Oregon. Here it borders not only on British North America to the east, but on the Viceroyalty of New Spain to the south. The fledgling United States of America lies east of the Great Mississippi River. The plains of Louisiana and the valleys of New California channel Peruvian silver and Mexican gold. At Fort Ross, oh, you can't go back, no, sorry. The forward. At Fort Ross, that is Rus from Russia, a full 90 miles north of La Misión Dolores, Alaskan fur fetches a good price in Spanish gold. In 1815, the year of Waterloo, a young Aleut goes on a trade mission to Fort Ross. His clan calls him Chugachnak, but Father Herman, who baptizes him, names him Peter. He is in his early 20s, possibly his late teens. The Jesuits from La Mission Dolores, now called San Francisco, refuse to believe that he is a Christian when he protests his orthodox faith, showing them his cross. They order soldiers to convert him forcibly to the faith of old Rome. Despite losing his fingers, hands, <coughs> toes, and at last his entrails, Peter holds firm. When the news of his, for, of his torture and death at last reaches Father Herman, the monk turns to his icons and prays, Holy martyr Peter, pray to God for us. <coughs> a mission may be built from is not may, may be built from timber, brick, and stone, but it is only sealed with the blood of its martyrs, mingled with the precious <coughs> blood of Christ. What are you willing to give up? Is not only a question that missionaries must ask themselves. It is a question posed to all prospective converts. As Father Herman lies dying on 15 November 1836, age 86, he does not ask the prayers of Governor Baranov, whom he has outlived by 17 years. He asks the prayers of his spiritual son, Peter the Aleut, who suffered much more than he. Part 3, The Mission to the Yupiks and Tlingits. 
With the last of the original eight missionaries gone, the torch passes to the first missionary actually born in North America. Father Jacob Netzvatov, half Russian and half Aleut, is born at Atka, one of the smaller Aleutian Islands. Educated in Irkutsk, Russia, he develops an al alphabet for the Aleut language, teaches literacy, and establishes a mission among the same Yupik Eskimos who martyred St. Juvenali 48 years earlier. Venturing deep into the interior as far as the Yukon and Kuskokwim rivers, Father Jacob personally baptizes no fewer than 1,320 people. Enlightener of Alaska, as he is known, he takes risks. A missionary takes risks. Father Jacob's journeys bring him into contact with the most fearsome of native Alaskan cultures, the Tlingit of the lush green forests of the southern panhandle. The inset map shows how the Tlingit country borders on the Canadian <coughs> province of British Columbia. These are the people of the totem poles. Not idols, but icons representing the personified spirits of nature. A dignified, warlike people, the Tlingit live by raiding neighbors and enslaving them. They wear birchwood armor in the shapes of powerful beasts. Most revered is the Thunderbird, bringer of storms. No Orthodox missionary in the Aleutians has ever dared to approach the Tlingits until now. Father Yohan Venyaminov, a native of Irkutsk in Siberia, arrives originally with a wife and son on 29 July 1824. Father Herman, still, an, a, still active on Spruce Island, is among the first to welcome him. Improving the alphabet that his friend Father Jacob Netzvatov developed, Father Yohan translates much of the Holy Scriptures and the Divine Services into Aleut. Settling on the small, in the small Russian town called New Archangel, now Sitka, Father Yohan becomes the first European ever to live among the Tlingit and record the language in writing. Tragically, his wife dies while he is visiting Irkutsk. Providing for his son, he takes monastic vows in 1840 with a new name, Innocent. A story is told of Archibald Wright, later Archbishop Innocent, living among the Tlingit. Who is your most important man? He asks. They bring him to the shaman. The one who intercedes between humans and the spirits of nature. How does one become a shaman? Father Innocent asks. They tell him that first a man must die, fall off a cliff, be mauled by a bear, killed, and so forth. He then journeys to the land of the dead, and returns to life carrying the secrets of the ancestors. There is such a one, begins Father Innocent. Using shamanism as his basis, he expounds the resurrection. Father Innocent among the Tlingits reminds us, a true missionary frames the truth, that is, Christ conquering death, in terms meaningful to his own listeners. He does not rely on formulas, but the universal human hunger for the sacred. In 1840, Father Innocent is consecrated a bishop. Within ten years, centered in Sitka, his massive diocese covers the Aleutians, the interior, and the panhandle. Trading by kayak among small island parishes, Archbishop Innocent goes everywhere with a retinue of beloved Tlingits, the very people that earlier missionaries never even dared to approach. At age 70, the tireless Archbishop receives his reward when the Synod of Bishops elevates him to, his, to a new post, Metropolitan of Moscow. 
True to his many missionary years in Alaska, Metropolitan Innocent works in revising liturgical texts and providing homes for impoverished clergy throughout the Russian Empire. A lasting tribute to the work of Metropolitan Innocent while Archbishop of the Aleutians in Alaska is a version of Our Lady of Kazan, now called Our Lady of Sitka. The holy icon rests in the Cathedral of St. Michael the Archangel, for whom New Archangelsk, New Archangel, now Sitka, is named. Still a flourishing parish today, the cathedral and holy icons testify to the heritage that modern America all too soon forgets. As a gift from the Russian-American company that the fur traders founded, Our Lady of Sitka proves that Father Herman won over Governor Baranov in the end. Part 4, The American Territory. The classic era of the Alaskan mission ends when Archbishop Innocent returns to Moscow in 1867 to take up his post in Moscow. In the same year, 1867, disaster strikes. To aid with expenses incurred in the Crimean War of 1853-1856, Russia agrees to sell Alaska to Big Brother down south. The United States now extends to the Pacific. The areas in brown are territories populated mainly by Native Americans and governed by military force. The Secretary of State, William Seward, negotiates a deal for $7.2 million. U.S. newspapers of the time ridicule the purchase. Why pay $7 million for a block of ice? <laughs> for the Native Orthodox people of Alaska, the deal proves deadlier than any Arctic winter. A Presbyterian missionary formerly stationed in Denver, Colorado, Sheldon Jackson becomes governor of the new territory of Alaska. The year 1867 is the peak of the Indian Wars in the Plains. The doctrine of manifest destiny, which brought the U.S. into war with British Canada in 1812 to 1815 and with Mexico in 1846 to 1848, asserts that the U.S.A. has exclusive rights over the North American continent. In Jackson's mind, it goes hand in hand with iconoclastic Protestantism. Under imperial Russian law, anyone speaking Russian and adhering to the Orthodox Church was a Russian. In Jackson's Alaska, natives are Indians. Territorial militia round up Aleut, Yupik, and Tlinga children, separating them from their parents and relocating them to Presbyterian and Methodist residential schools. Even Russian immigrant men married to native women are forced into the reservations. A so-called missionary working for the Baptist mission kidnaps the young son of Olga Sumakov, an Orthodox Aleut, in 1870 and never faces legal charges. In March 1896, the Moravian boarding school in Nushagak in the northwest bans the local Orthodox priest from imparting the precious blood and body to Orthodox Yupik children. Mrs. Agnes Newhall of the Methodist Mission in Unalaska forbids Father Alexander Kedrovsky from having any contact with Orthodox Aleut children there. No children, she writes to him, are to attend the Greco-Russian church. Sacrileges are common under Jackson's regime. The U.S. Federal Marshal orders an Orthodox Tlingit woman's body removed from the coffin in church in order to give her a Presbyterian funeral. When her priest objects, he is charged with obstructing the, pre the peace. Jackson orders holy icons removed from native homes and cold churches on the grounds that they are pagan totems. To Mrs. Newhall and Governor Jackson, orthodox means native 
means pagan. One courageous Orthodox bishop of Alaska tirelessly defends the rights of his flock. <coughs> bishop Nicholas Zyorov appeals directly to President William McKinley for defense against Sheldon Jackson and his missionary accomplices. Will you be acting consistently, he writes, if while w waging war for the liberty of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, for their human rights, you ignore these matters at home? Mr. President, be indulgent and gracious to poor, hapless Alaska. The New York Tribune accuses Bishop Nicholas of blind and unwarranted prejudice against this Protestant country and its excellent schools. The long-term effect of the residential schools is evident to our day. Often forcibly removed from villages and whipped in schools for speaking a single word of Aleut, Yupik, or Tlingit, probably Russian too yet actively discouraged from settling in white American towns. Orthodox children are gathered with or without parents onto one of six reservations, all of them located in the Tlingit Panhandle. Conditions on these reservations leave much to be desired. Cardboard siding hardly protects you from a minus 60 degree wind chill. <coughs> Part 5, The Lasting Legacy. Does the story of the Alaska Mission of 1794 end unhappily? Far from it. Like certain parishes that contend against the odds, against all the odds, Orthodox Alaska is poor in pocket, but rich in spirit. From about 1890 onwards, Waves of immigrants from Orthodox Europe and the Middle East begin flooding North America. Many of us from what is now the Orthodox Church in America, OCA, are descendants of immigrants such as these from the Ukrainian-speaking regions of Austria-Hungary and the Russian Empire. Prairie churches such as the first one built in Vostok, Alberta in 1901 represent this heritage. What has this immigration to do with the Alaska Mission? Everything. The figure who weaves the two strands of Orthodox North America into one is Bishop Tichon Bilavin. Born in the province of Pskov in Russia, he immigrates to the USA in 1898 the same year Bishop Nicholas writes his letter of protest to President McKinley. The center of his diocese is now New York City. Significantly, it still bears the name Diocese of the Aleutians and Alaska, which he simply changes to the Aleutians and North America. By now, the widest variety of traditionally Orthodox cultures have immigrated. Bishop Tichon defends delegates authority to bishops and priests who speak these immigrant languages. These include Archimandrite Sebastian Dubovic, Dabovic, a Serbian-American from San Francisco, and Archimandrite Rafael Hawawini, an immigrant from Beirut, who lays the groundwork for what later becomes an archdiocese under the Sea of Antioch. They are working under Bishop Tichon. Under the Omophorion of Bishop Tichon, more than 20,000 yes, 20, former Uniates or Greek Catholics of Carpatho-Rusin and Ukrainian origin returned to the Orthodox Church. Father Alexis Toth from the Preshov region of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, now part of Slovakia, leads the way. As a result, Rusins from the Carpathians and Ukrainians from Galicia soon outnumber actual Russians. Welcoming Orthodox immigrants is also a mission. For a few generations, most seminarians at my alma mater of St. Tikhon Seminary in Pennsylvania 
were either Carpatho-Rusin or Aleut and Tlingit in origin. Now Alaska has its own seminary, St. Herman's in Kodiak. The best symbol of Bishop, later Archiman, Arch, Arch, Archbishops, Archbishop Tichens, golden years, is the parish of Holy Trinity in New Orleans, Louisiana. Founded in 1864 amid the war between the states, its first priest was Father Ahapi Honcharenko, a Ukrainian immigrant. The congregation included Greeks, Russians, Serbs, Syrians, and several newly freed African-American former slaves. The services and, and minutes in 1864 were kept in English, <coughs> the language that all these groups had in common. Holy Trinity is now a cathedral under the Greek archdiocese. But notably, its current priest is Proto-Presbyter George Wilson, Many language cultures under one holy synod using a common English lingua franca thus both precedes and embodies Archbishop Tichon's missionary vision. Returning to Russia in 1907, Archbishop Tichon finds himself elected the first patriarch of Moscow since the office was blocked by Tsar Peter I in 1721. Through the dogged efforts of Archbishop Platon, Rozhdesvensky, the original diocese of the Aleutians in North America, by now has grown into a metropolia in 1924. Defying directives from a newly created USSR, the heirs to Father Herman, Bishop Innocent, and Archbishop Tichon hold fast to a principle. We are no one's diaspora. We are the local church. Metropolitan Platon's defiant stance against the USSR reflects the long legacy of refusing to compromise mission and surrender it to secular powers. The spirit of old Father Herman or Yeromag Juvenali defying Governor Baranov thus lives on. Almost, after almost 50 years of wrangling with the Synod in Moscow, in the days of the USSR, in the days of the Cold War. By 1970, the Metropolia has acquired the right of electing its own bishops. By, handling the, by handing the official tomos of autocephaly to Bishop Theodosius Lazar, later Metropolitan, Bishop now of Pittsburgh, Moscow relinquishes rock claims to the mission that it began in 1794. The Metropolia drops all ethnic adjectives, calling itself territorially the Orthodox Church, not of, but in America. Not of, but in. Its first major act involves elevating Father Herman of Spruce Island to the status of a saint. Within the last decades of the 20th century, St. Herman of Alaska, in his little skeet in the background, St. Innocent of Alaska, Patriarch St. Tichon of Moscow, former Archbishop of New York, St. Alexis of Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, whose relics I used to venerate every day in seminary, and St. Raphael of Brooklyn, the first of, these the first of these missionaries glorified in the present millennium, come to intercede in their holy icons for the mission planted in the Aleutian Islands 225 years ago. None of them founds a self-enclosed ethnic ghetto. No missionary ever does. These are the true guardians of the Alaska mission, an orthodox Taliban, if you will. Is it terrorism to know what you believe and be willing to fight for it? The weapons that they use do not kill but give life. They are prayer, worship, and teaching sound doctrine 
instead of destroying, they bestow eternal life. Few Orthodox in modern times have been missionaries. Economic migrant communities always prevail in terms of numbers. In 2010, the vast majority of, cradle orth of Orthodox, cradle or convert, in the U.S. live in the large industrial cities of the East and California, where Ukrainian steel workers or gold miners, Russian refugees from Bolshevism, Greek fishermen, Syrian shopkeepers come to seek a better life. Sparsely populated Alaska has fewer Orthodox than most sister states. Its Orthodox people, however, are no strangers in a strange land. They are no one's diaspora. They are a mission. Whether Alexander Baranov or Sheldon Jackson, those who exploited or persecuted the Orthodox natives of Alaska, ended up by wedding them inseparably to the Orthodox Church. <coughs> Today, the majority of the Aleut and Yupik nations, a plurality of the Tlingit, many of the Tanana, and the Athapaskan peoples of the East, still adhere to the Orthodox Church more tenaciously than they did in the days of the missionaries. The memory of their defenders, from St. Herman to Bishop Nicholas, reminds the First Nations of Alaska of a time when they were equals, not relegated to the despised status of Red Indians or Eskimos. Against the majestic backdrop of the mountains, the Cathedral of the Ascension on the large island of Unalaska in the Aleutian chain has a Russian-style cupola, but its congregation is as diverse as North America. The St. Innocent Prayer Society a joint venture of, Jew, of laity and clergy is mostly native, Aleut, Yupik, Tanana, and Tlingit. From the earliest years of St. Herman and his fellow monks and among the Aleuts, European and natives have blended customs and blood. The woman on the right wears a European dress and a silver Orthodox cross. Orthodox Alaska, like Russian America, is colorblind. Mission always is, if it is the mission of the gospel. It matters not at all whether your blood is Russian or Aleut, Dupik or Ukrainian, Klingit or Syrian or Greek, or any of the countless cultures whose progeny have immigrated to Alaska over two centuries. What matters is whether you are Orthodox. As a native son of the OCA with no Native American blood, let alone Native Alaskan, now serving the Sea of Antioch, which is equally and similarly open to mission, I pose three questions to prospective missionaries and remind them of one truth. Do you promote the local language as Saints Herman, Innocent, and Tichon did. It is not necessarily the first language of the majority in your congregation, but the language that the majority in your area is likely to understand. <clears throat> Do you dare to teach the truth as Saints Herman, Innocent, and Tichon, Bishop Nicholas, and Metropolitan Platon dared to do? Do you dare to speak the truth to power? Would you cultivate a sense of the sacred, that is, a deep humility towards God, a heart that dares to break no matter what a hostile and cynical local culture might demand or propose? Lastly, I remind you of the obvious. Forgetting it means forgetting the gospel. The patient long-suffering, the struggles for survival, that lie at the beating heart of Christianity. Mission costs. On poor, hapless Alaska, weakest member fully integrated into the body, we bestow abundant honor. Holy Fathers Herman, Juvenali, Peter, Jacob, and Alexis, Holy Hierarchs Innocent, Tichon, and Raphael, 
and all ye saints of Alaska, pray to God for us. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. Christos kuchwudigut. Kagar kuchwudigut. Click it.